Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to start our second lecture, and um, let's see why. Um, whoops. Uh, and I think I'm just going to sort of hop through a couple different things today. One is um, to talk about independence. I sort of ended the talk yesterday with the discussion of an intuitive understanding of conditional probability. So we're going to spend a lot of time on that today. Um, we're going to talk, first talk about independence, um, and then we're going to talk something about Bayes' theorem. Uh, and I have probably about two problems we're going to do with Bayes' theorem. Some of them you might have seen before, but I, but I think it's important to go back and try to uh, understand Bayes' theorem and so on and so forth. And I think it will help you on the problem sets. Um, there's two big problems with conditional probability on the problem set that um, should be interesting and challenging to try to do. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to move on to new stuff, uh, which is basically uh, going into this notion of a probability mass function, and uh, uh, and we'll start we'll we'll sort of get to the start of that and do stuff like uh, expected values and things like that. So the first thing is um, this notion of independence, and I guess a simple way to put this is, um, you know, that given a particular um, set of events like of the event B, um, if if the um, probability of A is independent of the probability of B, then the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A. And that, I think, the best way to kind of understand that is um, to look at something like this graph over here, where you know it's conveniently constructed to look like well, you know, the probability of A looks like it's about half, and the probability of B, you know, who knows what it is, but um, the probability of, um, you know, I guess, the, I guess the, I guess the point is, is that that it it sort of evens out. I guess is the point. Um, if if um, if uh, if this if this if this piece if this piece takes up, if I know that the event A, if this if this piece if this portion of B takes up the equivalent amount of space that all of B takes up for the whole space, then you know. Um, then and, and vis a vis if uh, if um, all of um, if if the part of A takes only ha half of B up, then you in fact have sort of this notion of independence. Um, and in this this point, the point of this is that this sort of implies that given the probability of A and B, meaning this intersection of events, is it, if the probability it's equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B as we were talking about yesterday. If it's independent, then it's simply the probability of A times the probability of B, um, and sort of here's that's that's the event space notion, and it's sort of a question of just making sure that all the ratios work out. Um, so, uh, and I guess another way to think about it is, uh, you know, in a space like this, is uh, you know, if I were to tell you that each of these particular points in the space were e was equally likely, then the event, you know, the event that you know, you'd say that, oh, well, that means there's 16 points, so the probability is 1 16th. Um, so does the, does the if, it, if this is us rolling a die or something like that, but just saying here's the set of points, if I then say uh, the event that, you know, this value x is 3, um, does that influence what the value of x2 is? Well, it might if these probabilities were different, as they uh, were signed differently. But right now they're evenly distributed, so in fact it doesn't change it. So that's that's sort of how you can look at, I guess, an example of an independence, um, and it gets you quite far in trying to solve a lot of different different problems. Um, and I, I guess I'll move on to uh, um, Bayes' theorem, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and here, 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 I guess um, you can actually get to Bayes' theorem, the generalized form of Bayes' theorem, which is down here, by sort of taking, say, a two-dimension, I guess. A Two event set or something like that, um, and I've kind of screwed that up up there, but we'll get back to that. Which is that, you know, the probability of a sub one given b or a sub i for that matter down here um, is really just equal to the probability of uh, you know of b given a sub one uh, times the probability of a sub one over the probability the sum of the probability of b given a sub i over the probability of a sub i and um, over here, you can kind of see that in the sense that it's sort of like saying, uh, 
the probability of ace of 1 uh, given b is basically you take the, this point and you take this point and, um, sorry, if you, so, uh, so you, you take this point and this point, which have b in it, and you basically uh, multiply uh, the probability of b given a1 times the probability of a1, that should be up there, but it, it's the same, it, it, uh, and over um, the sum of that, this probability times, the, uh, plus the sum of this probability, which is, uh, this prob sorry, this probability, which is the probability of um, uh, a2, uh, Sorry, the probability of B given A2 uh, and uh, times the probability of A2. Um, so, uh, and, and you can get that to that from there. Um, so that's sort of the sample space interpretation of that. Um, and I think that we can go back to um, looking at um, you know, again back to the space where there's B and there's like A sub 1 a sub 2, a sub 3, um, maybe that's enough. Um, if you're looking for the probability of um, a sub 1 given b, um, that's uh, this area, right? Um, sorry, this area, norm is, it's equal to this area normalized by the area of b. Um, and, and I guess you can get to that by, um, you know, uh, Taking each of the little pieces, and you know, it's basically take this piece and put it over all the individual pieces. Does that make sense or no? <laughs> okay. So, does anyone? Um, so, so I hope that kind of makes sense. And um, I think you guys did a problem earlier that I heard about that that probably sort of gets to this point of like you know, this conditional probability stuff can be used and manipulated for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and uh, an example might be um, you have uh, a manufacturer who makes a detection mechanism for steroids says that his test is 99% accurate. And you know, if you read the fine print, it says that actually it's accurate if 99% accurate if the steroids are present. Um, and, it's ha and it produces 15% false positives. Um, and finally, you know, assuming, well, let's assume that 10% of all athletes in a particular sport take steroids. So if a news report that an athlete tests positive um, you know, are we really certain that the athlete actually, uh, you know, how, how certain are we? I mean, some people might say, oh my God, it's 99%. That person definitely, you know, has, has, has taken steroids. And the way that you, uh, the way that, uh, that, you know, we can take a look at this is we can say, well, there's two things. One is the probability that he's taken steroids. So either he's taken steroids or he or she is taking steroids, and, and the probability is 10%, so 0.10 or, or 1 over 10 that he's taking steroids, and the probability he's not, he or she is not taking steroids is 9 over 10. And then we go back to the probability, given that he's taking steroids, that the test came out positive is uh, 99 over 100. It's almost a sure thing. And, um, and that's that the test is positive and the test is uh, negative. Um, where T sub P denotes test, the test is positive and T sub N denotes the test is negative, um, that's obviously 1 over 100. And um, then, you know, moving on from there, um, going back to this notion of false positives, the probability uh, is that uh, the probability that it, he, tests po he tests positive given that he's not on steroids or taking steroids is, you know, uh, 15 percent, so, so 15 over 100, and similarly, uh, you know, this is 85 over 100. The the probability that given that he's not taking steroids, um, he tested negative. So the big question here is, who can tell me how to take the sample space, which is s t sub p, s t sub n, s prime t sub p, s prime t sub n. Um, who could tell me how to figure out, using the conditional probability we've been talking about, um, what the likelihood that, given that he tested positive, that he actually has, uh, that he actually takes steroids? Um, well, can you add up the two possibilities? Okay. So, what do you mean by that? So, <coughs> uh, so what, what, what the, the probability of what over? 
Oh, so what are the what are the two possibilities? Well, we know it's the positive, so the two possibilities. So this one. Okay, so it's the probability of s t sub p, because that's the one we're interested in, over the probability of s prime t sub p plus the probability of um, s t sub p. And we can see that basically, if we you know if we do this out, that that's um, you know 99 over 100 times 1 tenth over um, you know 9 tenths times 15 over 100 plus 99 over 100 over 1 tenth. So we can uh, get rid of the tens uh, and even the hundreds, right? So, so we were left with um, 99 over um, uh, 235 or 234. Um, and that's, you know, it's not that small 1%. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's a lot less likely. It's more like 40% or, you know, a little bit around 40%. So um, that's one example, uh, you know, just quickly going over this, uh, where, you know, you can use this conditional probability to find out some interesting things out about, um, you know, you know, based on knowing what, what all the facts are. Um, so then let me move on to another problem that you've kind of seen, and I want to actually go through it um, in three or four different three or four different explanations, um, and that's the Monty Hall problem, which is uh, you have three, three doors, uh, and we'll call them A, B, and C, and behind one of them there's a Krispy Kreme donut. And um, I'd like to select, you know, I'd like to select, say, door A, and Monty, who knows where the donut is, opens, say, door B, which he knows happens to be empty in this case. And um, he offers to let me switch. And the question is, should I be allowed to switch? And um, the whole point here is to actually go through um, uh, you know, one, one set of explanations is that, well, the probability that it's behind A, given that he knew, is, is you know, one third uh, regardless. And the probability that he that, that that it's behind B, given that he knew is zero. And if you think about the probabilities, um, that means that one minus one third is the probability that it's behind C, and that's two thirds. So that's one one way of explaining it. Another way to think about it is um, is to think about uh, uh, a, a more extreme example where we take the experiment to the limit, which is basically that. Imagine that instead of just two doors, I had ten doors, and with those ten doors, I, uh, I Monty opened up eight of the doors. You know, he he let me pick one. He opened up eight of the doors. Don't you think that it's probably behind the door that you know it's much more likely precondition that's behind the door that's um, that he hasn't selected. Um, so one thing is is that what we really want to determine is what the probability of A, given that Monty opened B, call it the mob, and the probability that um, it's behind C, given that Monty opened B. These are the two interesting things that I'd like to, to understand using Bayesian probability. So one of the things I need to know is what's the probability of the um, uh, of the um, that Monty opened B. Well, it's um, it's the probability that it's behind A times the probability um, times the probability that um, he opened B, given that it's behind A, plus the probability that it's behind B times the probability that he opened B, given that. Um, what's that? If it's if it's behind B, it's zero. Yes, that's the point. I'm, ad I'm adding it up. So the probability that so the probability that he's going to open B, given that it's B, is, is zero, just like you pointed out. And the probability um, that it's behind C times the probability that um, given that it's uh, given that give, it's like the, the open B, given given that it's behind C. And um, this one is the probability behind that it's behind A is one third. The probability of the that means that there's two 
um, there's two doors that he could open, and it's equally likely that he'd pick one of those two doors or he'd introduce some bias into the problem. Um, plus um, zero, because this is zero, because he knows that it's behind door B. Is there anyone that's not clear why that's zero? Um, it's, it's because, it, as, as, as I said, it's, he wouldn't open it because it's behind there. So plus zero, plus the probability that's behind C, one third, um, plus, uh, plus, the, plus the probability that he opened B, given, that's, given that it's behind C. So if it's behind C, he can't open A and he can't open C, so he has to open B. So that probability is one. So that says that, um, you know, that the probability that, um, sorry, not one sixth, but one half. And, and actually, the neat thing about this is that if you think about the symmetry of the problem, you can actually come to this conclusion. Um, you know, given that, then it, that he picked A, there's no reason why B or C are, is different. So you could actually d decide that it's a half, you know, just by looking at that intuitively, that that, that probability is a half. Um, so the probability that um, that he opens A, given that um, Sorry, the, the, the probability that's behind A, given that it's um, given that he opened B, is it's the probability of A times the probability um, the pro times the probability of um, that, he, that Monty opened B, given given A over the probability of um, M O B, right? And similarly, it's the same thing here. Probability of C over the probability that Monty opened B times the probability um, that Monty opened B given um, given C. Um, so, uh, so, so the point here is is that this is equal to the probability of A, which is one third, over uh, one half. Uh, and and the probability of um, Monty open B given A is uh, is one half, right? So that's one half. And similarly, so that so that what does that come out to? That comes out to one third. And finally, there's the probability of C, which is equal to one third time uh, over the probability that um, Monty opened B, which is equal to one half, um, and the probability that Monty opened B given C, which is which is one, right? So that's equal to two thirds, and looks like I've managed to squash everything in there. But the point is, is that we use the Bayesian probability to get to the same result. It's a lot harder than using your intuition, but it's possible to do. Um, and sometimes. You know the problems are so com complex. I mean, this is an, a simple problem where you can see that where, where the where the conditions are pushing the probabilities around. But it's nice to get and it's nice to get an intuitive feel for what's going on. But it it sometimes comp problems become more complex when you start dealing with continuous systems and things like that. That you might not be able to recognize uh, where there's something interesting going on that you can capitalize on to figure out more information about uh, a signal or or anything. What is the intuition that it's two thirds? Because most, if you watch the show, most people—it's not the show. The, 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 the thing that they do on the show is that he doesn't—he um, doesn't—he uh, doesn't know which. He doesn't open the door. I don't think he opens the door that he knows. I'm, the show. I'm not sure if this is the same. The quite this models of the show are quite the same. Is I think the way. I think there's there was a lot of. Um, Publicity about this problem when right. well, the Savant. columnist, yeah, yeah, in Parade magazine wrote about it, and the reason was that you really have to be careful the way you state it to say. I mean, you were careful, and I think everyone understood it. But but he has to play this game in a particular way. Mm -hmm. he, you're a given that he's going to open up one of the doors right. that doesn't have it, and that is a big forces his hand right. because anytime you don't pick the right one, he's got to open up the other not right. Now, if he gets to decide, I don't want to play today because I know you happen to pick the right one, he just won't show it to you. And, and that's what he would do on the show, you know, and not give you the option. And um, he actually got interested in these puzzles. He actually commented on them. Is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I saw something about this. So that was the assumption you made here, that it was a 50-50 chance whether he shows one or the other one or the empty one, assuming you pick the right one. So that has to be good. 
so by tomorrow, um, having done this, I hope you'll have fun with this problem 1.12, which is like Oscar and his dog or something like that. Uh, and it should be an interesting thing if you haven't done that kind of stuff before. Um, so um, now we're, I guess. I guess we've sort of talked about the interesting things that are in chapter one, so I thought that it would be good to move on to uh, chapter two, since you all already sort of had some discrete um, exposure to discrete probability. Um, that's not to say that we're not going to continue to do some discrete probability in here, but I think the, the interesting thing about random variables is that um, before we were doing things like, oh, let's you know circle some events. And that's, that's our notion of an event in a discrete probabil probabilistic system. Um, the notion um, that you have to deal with in terms of random variables is the notion that I'd like to um, group a bunch of events, but by doing it in a more, um, what's it, like it's a formal way by like assigning a particular number to it. And it's, it's a, you know, kind of a, a nice thing that, you know, is if, if I, Create a function that takes a set of events or you know a set of input values, and it and it creates a new function, I'm sorry, a new value, and that that's and that for events that are equal, I mean the events that are that, that I want to call of type A, that those numbers are equal, it allows you some more flexibility in um, in in the kinds of problems you can solve or things that you can model. Um, so. Uh, I guess, uh, and, and I think the other thing is, is that to note is that you can deal with this in a discrete or continuous way. Um, and so, let me just talk about one example, which is um, uh, let's say that there's this random variable r, which um, is equal to the number of uh, heads in three. Um, flips of a coin that um, uh, has, I guess we can just say that that is uh, has uh, probability p equals one half of showing up just to make this e this easy. Um, so how might I? Does someone have a suggestion as how I might go out figuring out? Um, you know what the possible values for that are, and what the probabilities for those values are. What would be these like one methodol method methodology for doing that? One of those trees. Okay. So there. Let's say that we will start with that h sub n notation and t sub n notation for different throws. There's h1 is on the first throw. Um, and T1 on the second throw. Um, uh, H2, um, T2, H2, T2, and H3, T3, H3, T3, um, H3, T3, and um, 3, T3. And that, basically what that ends up being is, is that we get H1, H2, H3, H1, H2, I'm sorry, H2, T3, um, H1, T2, H3, H1, um, H1, T2, T3, and then we, we're now on the second row, which is T1, H2, H3, T1, H2, um, T3, T1, T1, um, T2, H3, T3. Okay, and you know the probabilities they're all equally likely. So there's uh, you know the, the probability of any of these is um, one eighth. Um, so we could just say p of um, x, y, z is um, one eighth. Um, and so who can tell me what the values of r are here? One, two, or three. One, two, or just for this row. 
Three. Oh, okay, so that's three. Two. This is two. 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 One, two, one, one, zero. zero. Okay. So um, basically, our random variable looks like, uh, and we can just add a line, it looks like zero, uh, one, two, and three. And the likelihood of any particular one is basically we just find the ones that are similar. So for three, it's one eighth because of that. For two, it's three eighths. For one, it's three eighths, and for zero, it's um, one eighth. And you, know, you, you probably could have predicted that too because of the symmetry in the problem that this would be symmetric about that axis. Um, so all right, so so this thing right here is a one-dimensional representation of, I guess, what you'd call if you said, let's you know, let's figure out what the y-axis is for this thing and put, put these things up, you'd call this a PMF, which is a probability mass function where the mass is sort of the value of the, the probability. And it's very similar. This, this probability mass function is, you know, has the same properties since we're grouping events um, as the probability measure space we're talking about. So you get the two things like, um, the, and the way we talk about PMFs is, in this case, PR of R sub zero. So this would be R. Um, and these would be the r sub zeros, and, and this would be p of r of r sub zero. Um, let's see that that that. Uh, what are you going to say about that? I mean that that basically that that's that's the the PMF for this. And uh, why do you use the word mass? Um, I, I don't know if there's any particular. I don't know. Do you, like I think it's just a nice analogy between this and like uh, solid. Uh, so, I mean, like when you do expected values and things like that, like if you're looking at um, center of masses and things like that, it's it's um, probably a likened analogy, I guess, except that everything's normalized by one. You could also say it's one. analog to the continuous, given that right. in the continuous there's no mass. Right. In any one That's right. So that so that right so that <coughs> when you're trying to deal with um, a continuous system or one where um, you've got masses at a particular point, like you do it deal with in <coughs> physics, uh, you would. You deal with them in sort of the same way, so I think that's a good point. Um, so what was I going to say? So, oh right. So this. So the next thing is, is that you know this thing has some properties like uh, you know this is less than or equal to one, and it's greater than or equal to zero, um, and it's also the case. So I mean, and, and I guess that, um, and it's also the case that the sum over r sub zero of P sub r of r sub zero that has to equal one, just like the sum of all the probabilities of a set of events, which is basically saying the same thing, is equal to one. Um, so, uh, you know what? You, you can also you know do stuff like you know with the sample space. Uh, if I told you that uh, the value of r was two, um, who could tell me what the what um, what who could tell me how to figure out what the what the likelihood is, or so what's the probability that the first thing came up heads, and how would how would you figure that out? You have an idea? Two. Would oh. Okay. The the sample space is are the things with twos. Right. And each is. You look and you can see that two two of those. Okay. Come up with heads and the other doesn't. Right. So it's two. So the probability, since they're equally likely, is you know one third or one sorry one eighth. Plus one eighth over one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth, which is equal to one or sorry two thirds. Um, let's see. So then, uh, I guess the, the I guess sort of the last thing I wanted to finish up with here today was um, I guess we kind of did this on the board so. Um, and that's this notion of an expected value and a variance, um, and that gets back to what we were talking about the masses and things like that. And that, and and these are tools that l help you figure out, um, like I'd call them features. Is is one way you could look at them, and people sort of what? Oh. No, no, oh. I can't see it on the screen. Oh, really? Um, so. So like a feature, like if I describe to you something like what's the expected value of uh, this particular function, meaning this probability mass function, 
you'd have some idea of where its center of mass was. Um, if I described to you what its variance was, you'd have some idea of how it spreads out across that center of mass, um, or uh, you wouldn't know exactly how it looked, but you'd have some sense. And I'm sorry I met, misspelled the word measure there, but... Uh, Does uh, the variance have some kind of physics interpretation? I don't... I'm not sure if it does actually. The second mean, there's a second, there's the second, it's a second, basically one of the second means, and I don't think it does. I just find it weird that they put the mass in. There's okay. a set of axioms in there, and they have a measure of a set, and all of a sudden you have mass. <laughs> Where does that go from? Okay. So, uh, I've heard people talk about variance uh -huh. in poker strategies. Uh -huh. basically, basically, meaning like if you have a higher variance, you're likely to win and lose larger amounts of money. Uh -huh. uh, with that strategy, then a strategy with a lower variance. Is that the same concept? Um, so you're saying that you categorize, you categorize a strategy with a variance? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I imagine that um, that if you're following a particular um, strategy, you have some sense of uh, a certain model, and that there's probably some type of variance associated with that. And what was the comment that you'd make more money, or I, the idea that I've heard expressed is that a strategy with the, that gives the higher variance uh, yeah. is going to cause you to win and lose larger amounts of money at a time. I see. Uh, so what you probably oh I see. So what you probably are seeing there is is that there's this notion of an expected value for like I would characterize a strategy at, with an expected value on the system, and then I would say oh is this a wide distribution? Like with the variance, and I'd say, oh, well, that means that you could have exactly what you just said, which is I have to spend more money, or I mean, I'll, I could lose a lot more money than I would um, with this other strategy. And that's not to say that you won't, you know, you definitely won't, but or you definitely will either way. But it's more likely, or the distributions work out that way. Um, so let me just write out actually how how this how this how this looks. Um, it's basically, so the expected value of, of x, that's equal to the sum over, um, let's say, you know, whatever the random variable is. Let's say that it's um, x sub 0 of, um, it's x times the probability of x, the PMF for x. Um, and basically, uh, you know, some interesting things like that are, you know, imagine your distribution function uh, looks like uh, this over here. Um, you know, uh, how would you? I guess so. We could we could calculate this one. This is this one is. Uh, let's see, we could say that x x zero is. Um, we could we could we could do this with r sub zero. So r sub zero would be it'd be one eighth times zero or zero times one eighth plus uh, one times three eighths plus 2 times 3 eighths plus 3 times 1 eighth. And that's equal to um, uh, 9 eighths, so 12 eighths. 12 eighths. Um, 6. Is that right? No, did I screw that up? 6? Oh, that's right. 9 plus 3. 12. And that's equal to 1.5, right? So... Um, that sticks you right here, which is what you sort of expect. But so, you should be careful with this because sometimes that that uh, uh, don't think that it'll always pop you in the center. It depends on the distribution and the values. Um, so uh, and then the variance is basically uh, the same type of thing, which is basically uh, you know it's it turns out to be the expected value of x minus the expected value of x squared. Uh, and I, I don't know if we want to go through the whole, uh, I, mean, we, I guess we could. Uh, uh, let's see, let me clean up the board a bit. So we said that the expected value of x was equal to uh, 1.5, the expected value of x minus x bar um, squared 
that's the variance, and that's equal to um, the sum. It, I mean, it actually turns out to be the case that in the, in the book you'll actually prove this that um, that it's the expected value of x um, x squared minus um, the expected value of um, the expected value of x squared, I believe, right? See, it's the expected yeah. value of x squared, right? Right. Right. Um, so, uh, I guess I guess the point is is that uh, uh, the, the point is is that you can you know you can calculate this. I guess I probably I mean I, you just have to plug in a bunch of numbers and you can do either one of these. And uh, I guess that's all I actually really wanted to cover today. Uh, but um, today I think the focus is basically in the problem sets is doing the conditional probability in problems 1.12 and 1.13 and the problem in two is actually pretty 